to everybody for joining us today for our panel on sponsored residential services. I'm Lucy Beadnell with the ARC of Northern Virginia. And to walk through this service today, I'll give you a little bit of a background on what sponsored residential is and the ARC's interest in it. And then we'll let our panelists go down the row and talk about their background and interest with sponsored residential and <coughs> stories they want to share. And then we'll open it up to questions. So if you can give folks time to talk through kind of their basics, be sure to be writing questions down in the meantime, and we'll make sure everybody gets a chance to ask anything that they would like. So our state <coughs> Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services is the state government agency that navigates and runs our waivers really on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're the people in Richmond who are writing the contract for what our waivers are going to look like and things like that. And this is what they've written into our contract. <laughs> so this is how they define what sponsored residential is. So services that take place in a licensed setting. So that means it's not just someone's home or someone who decides to do this one day or another. As folks up here can attest to, the licensing process is long <laughs> and arduous. It means there's background checks and there's training and there's all kinds of oversight and other kinds of things. So right away be thinking this is taking place in a setting with some oversight and regulation really happening. Uh, and it takes place in a home. And so when you think about what home means, what home means to anybody, right? Like it should look like a house, like anybody else would live in a house or an apartment or a condo or whatever that looks like, those same kind of settings anybody else would be residing in and no more than two individuals with disabilities are living here. So this is something, one of the many things that sets sponsored residential apart from the traditional model of group homes or kind of congregate settings. This is meant to feel more like a small family setting. Most sponsored residential homes, and the folks up here can speak to it more that I know about, have one person with a disability living there. So usually it is a very person-centered model. The whole world is kind of wrapped around this person with a disability who's living there. And the other folks living in that home are usually, though not always, the people who own that home. So <clears throat> they are almost like, um, they're called the sponsor and they're the, the paid support staff. So in the same way as if you had a child with a disability, which I imagine most of you can imagine living in your home, and you're there in the morning and you help them in the morning and you help them after work and you help them in, during the weekends and if they wake up overnight and they're sick, you help them. It's that same kind of dynamic, right, that you are there all the time for this person. They are effectively part of your family in some form or fashion. Uh, and the services that are offered depend upon the needs of the person living there. And that should always be the case, right? It's not necessarily that we're going to plop you into a home with someone who has 15 years of nursing experience and you haven't had a sniffle in two decades. That doesn't make sense, right? We should be looking for a match where your sponsor and your needs are really closely met by the person with whom you're going to be living and sharing your life here. Since Medicaid has redesigned our waivers in 2016, and I'll send out information about that to folks because I feel like it's something we can always keep absorbing, this service is only available under the, what's called the Community Living Waiver now. And so if you were familiar with our old waiver system, that used to be called the Intellectual Disability or ID Waiver. So this isn't available to everybody with a waiver. It's available to people with that community living waiver level of need. One of the things that I think has been really interesting with sponsored residential services in the last few years is that in Virginia, and especially in more rural parts of Virginia, we have seen way more people look towards this model than we have seen in the past. And we have a settlement agreement in Virginia right now that's governing the way we restructure our support and go forward with things in terms of serving people with disabilities. And the person who reviews that settlement said, in looking at what I see all across the state, though there are exceptions all over the place, I see some of the most complicated people in Virginia, both in terms of medical complexities or care complexities or behavioral complexities being served successfully and for the long term in sponsored residential settings. And you can imagine is what we've seen with all sorts of things, <clears throat> we're talking about a setting wrapped around this person, usually the only person with a disability living here, usually a setting and a caregiver custom fit for them, kind of a world built around their needs. And lots and lots of studies from all over the world have shown if you are happy and well supported and the world is wrapped around you, your behavior needs often go down. <laughs> and in many cases you are feeling happier and better, and in some cases your medical needs go down. So that's part of the reason we're seeing such complex people served in these kinds of settings so successfully and over such a long period of time. 
and as someone who answers a lot of the calls and emails that folks from the Arctic Northern Virginia get, I would say in the last three years, and especially the last 18 months or so, the number of calls I've gotten from people saying, I want to be a sponsor, how would I do that? Or families saying, I want to learn more about this or to do this, or yeah, that seems like to strike more of a chord with me than a group home or a more traditional setting, has skyrocketed. And so that's why we brought this panel together today and like why we have it included in our guidebook there on housing and why we'll be archiving this and sending that out. I expect that interest to continue to grow over time. So with all that kind of background being said, I'm just going to give you the names of our panelists and a little tiny bit about them, and then we'll let them take a turn, each giving some background information on their connection to sponsored residential services. So first and foremost, the wonderful Mike Gillies. So Mike can talk more about it in detail, but when I mentioned earlier that usually we're looking at a sponsor having a home that they own or they rent or whatever, and a person with a disability moving in with them, that's the way it usually works. Mike was very much a visionary and said, I love this model, I love that feel, but let's do it differently. And what if we own the home, so it's always my son's home, no matter what changes in his life. This house is customized around him, and he never has to move, and we let the sponsor come in. And otherwise, it looks the same, and it's this kind of family-feeling environment, one person with a disability is living there. Um, but if you want to talk to someone who gets it from a parent perspective and is smart and has put more blood, sweat, and tears into this than I can imagine, Mike's your guy. <laughs> so next we have Norma Israel from Riva, which is kind of under the umbrella of the Sunrise Group, which is more your national heading. So they've got a big footprint starting down in Florida and working uh, their way up toward us. And Riva has been an operator for Medicaid waiver services in Northern Virginia for a long time, but I think your dabbling in sponsored residential is newer than some of those other services. And so then we have Catherine from ResCare. And ResCare is the agency with whom Mike's son works. So Catherine can talk to you about it from kind of the agency perspective as well as what the lineage is here between the person with a disability and the family and the provider and how those things go back and forth. And Shakita came to us very recently from Lupin Family Services of Virginia, who's a provider who really, I feel like, is doing a lot more to expand in Northern Virginia, especially with this service. And it was actually her coming to one of our team meetings recently that prompted the idea for this panel, so I'm very happy to have you here. <laughs> and then next we have Rachel Dresner. And so Rachel is our only sponsor on the panel. This is her life. She does this service, and she works with Mike's son and under Catherine. So again, you'll see the whole lineage there. Um, and the fact that they all wanted to be here together today at the table to talk about this should tell you something <laughs> about how well this is going uh, and how much they put into this and how successful that is. And last but certainly not least, we have Jack Wall on the end from Wall Residences. And for many years when I started in this field, if someone said, what is sponsored residential services, the answer was talk to Wall Residences. I mean, I feel like you all really have been doing this a phenomenally long time and really uh, led the way in how this was done, not only in service provision, but in advocacy in other ways. So you got a great brain trust up here. I would feel free to ask them all kinds of things once they're done with their introductions about how this would work and how problems are solved and those kinds of things, because we're not likely to have this amazing group of people in the room again at some point. So with that all being said, thank you so much for your patience with my rambling, and I'll turn it over to Mike to give us a little bit of background. <laughs> uh, very quickly, you've already heard I set up our 37-year-old son, Rogan, uh, lives with a young lady down the road here, which I know they're all young ladies, but <laughs> white sweater on, uh, and her family. And I think that's important to note a couple things about this. First, let's go back. I'm going to start very slowly why we did this. Uh, our, my son does not communicate. He does not talk. He's now in a wheelchair. He was not when we first went over there uh, and got set up. So he doesn't communicate. He's mentally uh, challenged, intellectually challenged. And we had had an experience back when he wasn't physically abused but mental abuse from another client that was being served in another agency just like him. He said, wait a minute. He couldn't tell us this. The way we found out, the other client has a sister who was unfortunately also in the program and told her, on her brother. Uh, and we said, you know what? This gets us thinking. How are we going to do this? And there are excellent other alternatives out there in terms of group homes and such as that. But my thing was, one, I have a, muscle, a very rare and unique muscle disease. We didn't know if Rogan had it at that time because there was no way of telling how you diagnose it, et cetera. So what if his needs change was one big thing. The second thing was I did not want to go through the trauma of, okay, his parents have passed on. Now we're going to take him completely out of his environment. 
all his doctors, all his friends, all his programs, and move him somewhere else. Uh, until about the last 10 years, you had a hard time finding a sponsored residential home in Northern Virginia, period. And yes, there are group homes, and we know that they're always, almost always uh, have slots in them that. So that was part of it. Uh, Lisa mentioned the only real twist is we purchased the home. Uh, there's a special exception mortgage through Fannie Mae that you can get that gives you a same as if you owned the home yourself, and you get all the deductions, all the tax write-offs, all that. Um, it's up between you and your financial advisor and your lawyer if you want the child to own the home, which I personally never recommend, or if we keep it in an LLC and pass it down to the trust when we pass on. Um, but let's talk about from a parent's standpoint, the financials and all that. I'll be glad to talk to anybody. I'm neither a lawyer nor a financial planner, so the call, I can always talk and tell you go somewhere else. Let's talk more from the parent standpoint, which is what I'm here because these people are much more knowledgeable on this. I told you why we did it. We didn't feel that comfortable that we're all going to be okay in a group home. Certainly didn't want an institution. He's obviously never going to live independently. He needs 24-7 care. Fortunately, Rachel can get up in the middle of the night because she's still a mom of young kids and she does it anyway, so it's her problem. <laughs> right now it's her problem, not ours anymore. Um, one, we've been very fortunate with Rachel. Uh, she's an incredible woman. Um, but I want to talk about some of the other things about the care. For example, does Rachel take better care of Rogan than we did? No, because Rogan's mom, my incredible wife, is an incredible mother as well as wife. She's a loving, wonderful woman. Meets his every need and all that. Is Rogan perhaps happier? Now, that's a big, big question in the current situation than he is when they're living with us. Well, let me give you a quick answer. Seven days. They normally say... Some places would say, don't come visit us for six months because we want your child to separate. It took Rogan seven days. <laughs> We're driving home. We said, do you want to go to mom and dad's house? Or do you want to go to your house? He was adamant. He wanted to go to his house. So it's one of those tear-jerking moments where you're so angry at your ungrateful little bugger. <laughs> choking. That's how quickly the transition was. Um, I've, read, I've written some things that are on the websites and here and other places. Rogan's life now is 90% of the time I, probably, I normally don't say this when Rachel's in the room. It's chaos. <laughs> if you walk into that house after school, your daughter just graduated. She's got a 10-year-old. Both of them have lots of friends. They have a dog. I don't know if they still have a cat or not. I don't like cats, so I don't ask. Um, <laughs> and it's just busy. It's constantly busy. Whereas Rogan would come home from his program before with us. He'd go in his room and lay there. He'd come out for supper. He'd go back and he'd come out every night and check on him. Figured out that he was bored out of his mind with what the problem was. Now he goes to baseball games. He goes to pools. He's gone to Disney World. Rachel has a problem with <coughs> Disney World. He's gone to Disney World many times uh, Good before he ever did with us. So better care, you have to face the fact that you're going to pass on. It doesn't matter how good a care you give. You're not going to be giving it after you're dead. So you better adjust to that fact real, you know, real soon as your child gets older. Selfies, nobody wants to be the parent who admits they can't take care of the child. You know, the closest I can come in thinking about this, and I'm, I know I only got five minutes, so I'm trying to speed up, talk fast, <laughs> is young women mothers or young women or, or young couples who give up their child for adoption. Because that's the only thing I can think of because well, I'm giving my child or somebody else to care for because I accept the fact I'm not going to be there and they might have a better, longer time, but mainly because I'm not going to be there at some point or they may have a better life. You have to be a little bit selfish. I know we've all heard that thing about God chose a selfish mother because she would take better care of the child. You have to be selfish to be a good parent, in my opinion, but you have to be selfish to be a parent of a handicapped child, too, because you have to face the realities that you do need to relax and rest a little bit when you get older. Um, the trauma of giving up your child in any situation, other than the child passing on before you, is difficult. But I'd be surprised if I went around in here and if everybody was honest, how many of you probably thought, I wonder if it wouldn't be better if my child died before I did, my handicapped child died before I did? And I think it would be an unusual person who hasn't thought that at some point in their care of their handicapped child, only because you want that child to be cared for. You want that child to be loved. You want that child to have a good existence. But you're also very concerned about what it's going to look like after you're gone and how you're there. Are you going to get the per perfect fit right off the bat like we did? I doubt it. But it's possible. Okay. The fact is, this is harsh, but people who wait till they're 70 and die and don't leave anything in place for a handicapped child, I think need a special place in hell for just a little while. 
Uh, and I know that sounds very cold and very cruel, but what you're doing to your child is worse than anybody's going to do to them from all the teasing we've watched, from all the things, the frustrations they couldn't do, all the plain crap you put up with watching your child put up with throughout their lives. I want you to think about it. You're gone. They're probably going to be taken out of their house. They may be taken out of the community. They're going to be taken out of whatever. I say that because it's an overwhelming thing to start this process and get it done. We, it can be done in six months. If you're not, well, I'll write that tomorrow. I'll do that tomorrow. But you, and I'm glad I don't see the same faces because they've heard me say this a hundred times. Inertia kills. It's very easy to be inertia and just sit there and wait for something to happen. Wait for somebody to bring you a solution. It's not going to happen, people. Just do it. The people here at this table, the R, there are lots of organizations out there to help you. Uh, I'm not a financial lawyer, but I am a parent. My phone number, web, my web, she's, my address, email will be on there. By all means, contact me. I will tell you what's very frustrating for me is another point. I've probably done, we did this for Rogan in 2010, been talking about it 2006. I've probably spoken with 10 or 12 other parents. I have yet to have one do anything. Now, why is that? Because it is so overwhelming, one. Because nobody wants to admit they, their child might be better off with somebody else. And that's what you're actually admitting and adapting to, is that child may actually have a more enjoyable life under somebody else. Will the care be as good? Possibly better. Certainly more enjoyable, my son's place. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is sponsors. Uh, I don't know the groups here. Uh, I want to talk about the sponsors in a couple things. And a very important thing that was mentioned, people kind of gloss on it, they go, oh, geez, the bureaucracy. <coughs> the regulation and the oversight, I strongly, strongly recommend whether you go through one of the organizations here, which is superb, or you go through somebody else, but you have that in place. Don't think we're going to do this because it's cheaper. I don't want to put the paperwork. You're gone. You're dead. You're not going to come up and say, is my child getting his medications? Is he being treated right? That's what these people get paid for. They're all very caring people. They probably do it for a lot less money, although I'm sure none of them want to take a pay cut. <laughs> but that's what they're there for, is to make sure your child, my child, and other children like them that are now adults are taken care of. Also, be realistic about who's going to be your sponsor who's going to take over. I work with one woman. She was 67. Who's going to take it when you die? Who's going to? Well, my sister, oh, great, that's good. Family knows the aunt. How old is she? She's 65. <laughs> well, come on, lady. Come on, think about this. I talk about the sponsors, and I have nothing against more mature folks since myself and their age. Uh, we deliberately look for somebody much younger, which Rachel is, much, much younger, <laughs> because they have the energy. They have uh, families. They have the stuff to get out there and go. Because when we first started looking into this, we were told, look for a retired couple. You know, they're home. They've got nothing. And I'm like, no, I don't want that. That's what he's got now, and he's obviously not happy. <laughs> uh, I'm not retired at the time, but it's like, why would I do that to him? Um, so keep in mind the regulation, keep in mind the younger sponsors, and a lot of, unfortunately, the reality is there are lots of single mothers out there, which was, Rachel was, and I'll let Rachel talk about her situation, but um, who are very loving, very giving. Get past your fears, get past what you think people are going to think of you, and believe it or not, that does influence some people, what they'll think of because you've given up your child for somebody else. Um, and just take the first step. There are so many people here that can help you. Just you've got to take the first step because otherwise, I think it was three or four months ago, there's a mother in Springfield, a wonderful woman, died. She's 70 years old, died in her house. The house was paid for, all that, and now she's the handicapped daughter. She's in an emergency placement situation because nothing had been set up. That's wrong. That is just flat out wrong. And it worked out. The ARC and other people got involved. There's some care meds. I think she's, li she's living in her house. She got to stay in all that. That's very lucky happenstance because it could have all been taken care of. You've got to take that first step. I know I talked too long. Sorry. <laughs> Tough to follow. <laughs> so, hello, yeah, everyone. I'll be quick. Um, <laughs> um, I really like what Mike shared about the emotional parts of it. Um, it's, it's sometimes it's hard as a provider to communicate that and, and make parents understand some of the issues and the separation factor and, and knowing that someone else will be the caregiver. Reva has been around since 1996 and we started with just two group homes and then we went to community supports. I arrived to Reva in 2014 from um, Sunrise Community, which is out of Florida, not associated with Sunrise um, retirement at all, um, and came to Virginia where we and we only had three sponsored residential homes at that point in time. 
Um, as of uh, this week, we have 15, and we're expecting a 16th one in the next couple of weeks as well. I learned about sponsored residential here. I knew nothing about it in Florida, and I immediately fell in love with it. I mean, what he talks about as far as being person-centered, you have one or two people, you go somewhere, it's not, here comes the group home. You know, you have a regular car, or even if you need a, a handicapped accessible vehicle, you have a minivan or something a little bit smaller. It's, it's, it's more family-centric, um, it's more person-centered, and um, with licensure oversight and everything, you still have to meet all the standards that a group home would have to meet. So um, I very much... Um, think it's a great service. We've moved one person from a group home into sponsored residential. I have another person hopefully moving on the 26th of June because we do still have homes with vacancies. And um, we've taken one person from community supports with their caregiver who developed uh, more medical needs over time. He's moved into her home and um, has never been happier, has absolutely never been happier. Um, so. I agree with everything he said. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful service. <clears throat> it may not be for everybody, but it is definitely uh, unique and um, and creative, and um, I think it's a valuable service. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm Catherine with ResCare. Uh, we actually do business that um, are under our license is called um, Blue Ridge Residential Services as well, and we're affiliate of ResCare. Uh, we've been in this area since 2007, I believe. We have about 207 individuals that we support across the state. Um, approximately 12 of those homes support two people. So like I said, I mean, we do, our philosophy is that more one-on-one -on -one, um, type support. Um, we do about 51 of those, 51% of those homes um, are bio biological, so they are family members that have developed to support their other family member. Um, so we do have a lot of that. Uh, offices are across the state and northeast and southwest of here. Um, about three of our families have done uh, what Mike was discussing with purchasing or renting a home and then having the sponsor move in and um, support the individual there. Um, so yeah, we're, we're growing and we're excited um, you know, to have people on board to open new homes. Our, our match system is, is very important. <coughs> if we have open homes, we really want to make sure our individuals um, have an opportunity to meet with those sponsors, get a good feel for it, make sure their likes and dislikes match so that they can have that person-centered experience. Um, but yeah, that's about it. I'm Shakita Drawn. I'm with Lutheran Family Services of Virginia. Um, Lutheran Family Services has been around for over 100 years. Um, they were known um, primarily for their therapeutic foster care program. Just recently in 2011, they began um, serving individuals in, um, in the developmental services um, settings um, where we have group homes, we, have, um, we provide in-home support, um, we do sponsor residential, of course, um, and then we offer day support services. So we service over 400 clients across the state. Um, throughout those various programs. In Northern Virginia, we're, we are only doing sponsor residential and in-home um, support services. Currently, we have 21 homes in Northern Virginia. Um, we have three vacancies, um, and we're actively recruiting new homes um, and new individuals to support as well. In-home is our newest baby um, for Northern Virginia, so um, we've recently been working a lot with the, uh, with the ARC of Northern Virginia to get that program up and running. Um, we have two active in-home clients right now, so we're in the process of hiring um, for staff to get that program afloat more. Um, and our story is kind of similar to the others. I mean, we love what we do. Um, it's, everything is person-centered. Um, our, our services are. We have a family care provi I mean, family providers as well as um, just sponsors in their homes to support individuals um, in their home. Um, I don't know. Lutheran Family Services has just been great. They're they're a well-established company, um, and and we've we've done well. Um, coming into this population, coming into working with this population, and we're hoping to grow more and make our presence more known in Northern Virginia. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Rachel Dresner. Um, as Mike mentioned, um, I am the sponsor for his adult son with special needs. Um, my personal background, I started working for Fairfax County Public Schools 
Um, I was recruited by a special ed preschool teacher who saw me in um, a daycare setting, and she said, what are you doing here? You know, my ratio at that point was one to 10, and she said, come in and work with me. We're only allowed to have seven kids in the classroom. She's like, your skills aren't being utilized here. Come, come on, come on, come for an interview. Um, I went in, I loved it. I loved working with the kids with the worst behavior problems, that's who I wanted to be with. I wanted to see if I could make a difference, and that really got me turned on to working with varying disabilities. And I'm going to kind of piggyback on what Mike was saying, talking about you do want someone with energy to work with your child. I'm going to say a key ingredient or personality trait that you would want to look for, find someone that can adjust to change because every day is going to be different. Let's say we had planned that today we're going to go to the pool. Well, let's say my individual wakes up with a fever. Okay, what are we going to do now? We're going to have a movie day and we're going to sit in on the floor on blankets and have popcorn. And you got to go with the flow and keep it moving, keep it interesting. Um, so back to being recruited by the, the school system, I thought, okay, I don't want to be a classroom assistant anymore. I wanted to go back to school. And that was difficult for me. Being a single parent with a then toddler at the time, it was very difficult for me to find coverage and still be at work. Um, I ended up... Um, uh, <laughs> it's not really retiring from civic <laughs> study schools, but resigning, I guess. Um, and I ended up with six part-time jobs. Um, I was, yeah, I was tutoring my old students. I was babysitting. I was providing respite care on the weekends. I was like a hamster on the wheel. Um, and then a friend of mine who worked for Blue Ridge at the time recommended me to Mike and Patty, who were looking for a sponsor for their son. And it was really hard for me. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, being, uh, he's going to make fun of me for crying. <laughs> but but uh, it's just me. Like the, the bottom line is I was the only one supporting my kids. And I only knew what I knew. I only knew, okay, I needed money. I needed to do this. I have to hustle, hustle, hustle. It never occurred to me that I could do one job that would take care of all of us and we all could have fun together. Blew my mind. It was scary, but I did it. And just like Mike was saying how scary it was for him, it was scary for me too. And you just have to take that first step and have faith and, and know that it's going to work out and it's going to be fun. And our first few days with um, his son, I didn't know what he was telling me, and he didn't know what I was talking about, but we made it through, and we are that much stronger because of it. Um, I think that was about all I wanted to touch on. I want to interject. There's one thing that you said that I stuck with me always, and so I'll send out a link to a video interview that we have with Mike and Rachel and his son that I, you can see them kind of working through the home on a day-to-day -day basis. But you described it as almost like being paid to be a stay-at-home mom, which I think yeah. is a way for people to wrap their heads around what this looks like. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I was saying I was stuck on this wheel where I did have six part-time jobs, but it was barely covering my bills. And fortunately for me, I was able to bring my son with me to tutor. I was able to bring him with me when I was providing respite, but what if I wasn't? You know, I would have to find, I would never see my kids. So this was an ideal situation where we moved into um, Rogan's home. And I, want, I don't want to say he's like my child because he's a peer. I'm only a few years older than he is. But we're, we're like extended family, and we all just fit, and he does. He gets dragged to baseball games, but he also gets to go to the movies, and he loves to sit in the recliners, and he loves to go to the Alamo and order the bougie popcorn. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, you're right. It, it is lovely. It, I feel like I'm getting paid to be a stay-at-home mom. Uh, I'm Jack Wall. I'm uh, with Wall Residences. Um, the, you know, I think what we're talking about here is what the ARC talks about is a life like yours. 
Uh, you know, the, the ability to live, you know, we all grew up in families. I remember I was really influenced significantly when I was in college many decades ago. Uh, <clears throat> I had a sociology professor who told me, mentioned that um, the family is the most important institution in, <clears throat> in society. And I was kind of taken aback by that to um, have that kind of a stark statement. But, you know, when you think about it, the family is the uh, unit, the um, social unit that does, ra we all get raised in families, you know. I mean, we, um, we basically did away with orphanages uh, for kids that didn't have families a long time ago. Um, we, uh, you know, <clears throat> a lot of us that are getting older are um, grappling with the uh, potential of a nursing home environment. Nobody looks forward to that. Nursing homes are kind of passe and, and, and only, um, hopefully only needed for people that have, uh, you know, significant memory problems or different things where they're not really included in that. Well, you know, really we've got to look at the whole group home model. The shift-based model is, is a, you know, is a basically an institution. We do need to get people into situations where they have true bonded relationships, where there is a relationship where you have a, you know, a total involvement with the people that, that are providing that, that care. Um, that is what the family is all about. Um, it, you know, the, the fact of some kind of model where people come in, uh, you know, we've, I've worked a lot with David Pataniak, some of you may know him. Uh, he's a huge advocate, and he, he does a lot of talking about this issue about that, that the, um, the group hall model, you, the, you know, the, you have program managers and group hall managers that are setting up um, schedules, and they provide what they call coverage. So you get people coming in, they're working their 40-hour shift or their part-time shift, providing that care. Well, that's not really, um, you know, David Patonik has some really amazing stories. He talks about that if he came home one night and, and his wife Cindy wasn't there and they had somebody else there um, to work with them, and, they, and he said, well, you know, David, you're okay. You've got coverage tonight, but it's not the same thing as having a relationship, you know, relationships that are built upon a, um, a foundational commitment between people is really what we're all talking about. You know, the other alternative that is very viable, of course, is independent living and various kinds of sports where people live in their own, in their own home is really viable. But the idea of people, lots of people need to live in a uh, shift-based model with whoever is on schedule coming in, doing their eight-hour shift and going home is, is really not the ideal. It is, it is a necessity. It is a necessity because we can't recruit enough families to do this kind of work. Now, just talk a little bit about wall residences. We, uh, well, I've been in the field for 45 years and started off in the dark ages with back, backward situations, uh, living, you know, working in institutions to get my start. But then um, I did get, um, you know, opportunities to live, work through all different kinds of models. And then in the, um, in the late 80s, I got uh, involved with a guy named Dr. Stanley Buckus, who was, came in to Virginia to um, lead the, the uh, disability-related services, and he brought a bunch of models from other states, and he talked to me about this uh, contract family model where you um, have an intensive model providing good funding and good support to people living in a family environment. He was very familiar with a model that had been operating for a while in Michigan, and I got a chance through Stan Buckus to um, meet folks from Michigan who were doing this model. And of course, you know, like I mentioned to you, when that connection I got from my sociology professor about the importance of the family, well, I immediately saw this was a, an incredible opportunity. And what they were doing in Michigan was really amazing. And it was nothing like it. But Stan was, you know, he was in charge. He was the guy who was writing the waiver that came into effect in 1991. So I was right there, uh, you know, and Stan made it possible, and I worked with him a little bit to make sure the regulations we had in Virginia allowed this model under the waiver funding. So when the waiver came available in July 1991, I was right there with a bunch of services that we set up where I had folks that I was working with in group home models who were immediately, who are not doing well in those models because their individualized needs were so significant. So I placed those people with into family homes with people that, really loved and provided the uh, intense level of, of support. 
So we've, from, you know, from that point of view, I worked with a couple of government agencies setting up sponsored residential, and then, we, and then uh, in 1995, we, we started Wall Residences, and uh, my wife and I were, did the service starting in our home, and then, but now we're up to, we have over 500 people we're serving across the state in uh, about something over 340 licensed homes. So it's, a, you know, it's, now it is mostly in other parts of Virginia. We don't have a big penetration in Northern Virginia, um, we do have some services in Loudoun County and a little bit of stuff in uh, Prince William. But it's been really difficult to recruit families to do this kind of work uh, and get the, um, get the start in doing it. We do have a, a, a stronger ability to get recruit families in more rural areas. It does seem like it's easier to get families that are willing to, to devote their time to doing this work in a little, uh, little, little more rural uh, parts of the state, so that's where our growth has primarily occurred. But it is a model that, um, that we, um, you know, have uh, promoted from the beginning, and we're working now with, since waiver redesigned, there were some uh, setbacks because the federal folks who came in to Virginia and looked at this model, they looked at it the way it had been done in other states, which was not as well-funded and not as as uh, well supported, and uh, we've been fighting to try to main maintain the parity we had for 25 years. It was a parity, you know, when Stan Bucket set this thing up, he set parity of rates. It was a co one congregate residential rate across the board, and, uh, and, and you know, that's allowed the funding so that the sponsored home can, can get the level of funding so they can really do this as a full-time professional job, and, uh, and, it, and that brings the whole benefits, and as was mentioned before, this program meets full licensure requirements. The only, only exception that sponsored residential has as an exception, which is not a requirement, but in general, the uh, sponsor provider is allowed to have uh, to be asleep at night. Uh, now, you know, we generally do a lot of monitoring at night, and we do have a lot of programs where they do have coverage, awake coverage at night, but that is the one exception to the same level, you know, the same level of regulation and uh, oversight occurs for sponsored residential as any, any other congregate residential model. So it is a um, truly a professional job. I mean, as, as people can, can tell you here, it's a lot of documentation, a lot of requirements to meet, and, uh, and it's very heavily regulated, but it does provide you that bridge to a family environment. And I'll... Let let it open to questions. <laughs> so I have a few. I was gonna. Ch one of our chatters, if you will, has sent in. Can you talk a little bit about the background of the caregivers? I know you mentioned that a lot of the caregivers have a family background or somehow already biologically tied to this person. But and you talked about your school background. But where do you mostly see sponsors coming from? What's their experience level? Well, for us, we've been able to, for Reva, we've been able to transfer, transition some staff um, to becoming sponsors, so they've had a long-term relationship um, with the individual. We do also have some family homes as well. Um, we've had a number of phone calls, so um, we get to know people, we do background checks as, you know, as required by the state, um, and then we work to try to link anyone that, that calls um, if they want to pursue. So a lot of ours are also just, you know, people who have heard about the service and want to provide the service. Um, I know with, the, with uh, Blue Ridge Breast Care, one of our best tools as far as recruiting others is our sponsors that are currently there. And that's how um, Rachel was actually um, informed of, of, of our program as well. Um, CSBs, of course, are very helpful. Um, organizations like the ARC and, and people that things like this are, are great tools for us. Um, so yeah, we've found that the majority of them, especially if they're family members, for instance, if their son or daughter attends a, a day program and maybe there's one particular staff that they really get along with um, and that staff person is possibly interested in, in licensing their own home and then supporting that individual, that would be someone um, we would definitely want to talk to and, and help make that happen um, if possible. So yeah, they're, they're a great tool um, and then just being around even like the same kind of doctors, the same kind of um, day support programs, the same schools that maybe they all went to, and, and it's really helpful to kind of have people that with those similar interests. We have we have monthly sponsor meetings 
And so they do. They network together. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Very Good. valid point. I'd like to say something on that one if I could. Obviously, I don't recruit sponsors. <laughs> but I think something that's a misconception is uh, they think about what your sponsors will be paid. I have no idea what Rachel makes. I know it's not enough. But it's a lot more than what a group home staffer makes in an eight-hour shift. And I think what you have to keep in mind, it goes by the level of support the adult needs. Mm -hmm. For example, you're not necessarily paid eight hours. You may be paid 14 hours a day. You may be paid 16 hours a day, depending upon what's needs. Now, you don't get 168 hours a week because the child, if that adult goes to program services or whatever, you don't get paid for that. But keep that in mind because that's a big thing. I think a lot of people say, well, I'm going to live in poverty the rest of my life by doing this. That is not the case at all. She's not wealthy, I will say that to Rachel, <laughs> but she's doing a lot better than when she was working six, six part-time jobs. What you're talking about is do you pay directly? No, I have nothing to do with her pay. <laughs> no, it goes through agency. Yeah, and, and actually, um, we don't really do it hourly anymore since that waiver redesign and that change. I think um, uh, Jack had mentioned that as well that those rates have, are now based on a, a tier model, um, and it's a, more of a daily rate than it is hourly. So like you said, you could have a day where you're only maybe uh, providing six hours of support, and then the next day they might need more because things like a fever happen or maybe they don't go to their day program. So it kind of averages out, um, but it's, it's the same daily rate. And they are, they, the rates are based on um, individual support needs. So, oh, so sorry. all of our individuals um, go through assist, a supportive intensive scale um, assessment, and then from that assessment, that's how de they determine what tier the individual is placed in. And depending on what tier the individual is placed in, determines the reimbursement rate mm -hmm. by day. And where actually does the money come from? The waiver. The, from the, yes. the community living waiver. Yeah. It's a waiver. The services are waiver funded. Well, it's also yeah. twofold, though. You do the <coughs> sponsor gets a payment for providing the service through the community living waiver, but there is also a room and board component from mm -hmm. the person's income. Okay. The individual's income? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What if the individual doesn't work? There's you, die. You, you die. third party benefit. Third party benefit. So yeah, oh, social security. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and sometimes it's agency based too. Like our model is where we only do. Um, our individuals pay 400 um, a month for rent. That's it. There's no, no, it's not based on a percentage. So I, I'm a provider, and uh, Jack Walls is, uh, we work with him. Um, so my son is 31, and uh, we take care of him at home. He gets uh, supplemental security, so, you know, we have a lease with him, and so he pays a portion of that money he gets from supplemental security to us for that. You know, and it's, you know, we're in control, we're his power of attorney and everything, but we have to keep records of even what's spent in that, in that fashion. And then the other piece that they're talking about, our son is very high on that support intensity scale. We believe that that's a very flawed tool and, and a, a very subjective tool based on the the assessor, and um, uh, everybody wants to feel good about their, their charge or their or their client or their kid. In my case, want to say, "Oh, he's doing great." You want to be real, real. You don't want to just go in there and make it all flowers and roses. Okay, you want to explain what the reality is, or you're going to. We have people who who. Verbal aggression during the assist assessment, uh, uh, physical aggression during the assist assessment, and the and the assessor is putting no physical aggression, no, mm -hmm. you know, and so so then that affects income, that affects yeah. how much money people are going to get, how much support they're going to be able to provide in respite care or in other services, and so you gotta. You got to have good advocacy. You got to have people like Ark around you. You've got to have case managers who really care. They're sort of part of the family, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Wouldn't you oh, agree? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I want to piggyback on what you were saying. When you go through that sis, describe their very worst day, not their very best day, mm -hmm. because those are the supports you're going to need. Uh, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, um, you know, 
I just want to make sure that this is a model that is available for people who may never be able to live independently, but still would be able, hopefully, to have a job in the community, right. whatever, so that it's, it's not just for people who need to be, like, at home constantly with 24-hour needs. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's one question I have, um, and the, the other thing is really, what do you do when some when the sponsor's life changes? I mean, oh, excellent um, question. You know, because people's lives do change. I mean, for example, you know, as a, as a single mother, mm -hmm. you know, I could maybe at some point you <laughs> might you know want right. to start dating, and right? Then, you know, yes. um, right. And obviously. Nobody goes into it with the assumption that, okay, this is going to be it forever. Mm -hmm. But we also want to make sure that we're minimizing the amount of transitions and change that, that the, the sponsee has to go through. Mm -hmm. um, and the third part of this is, um, are family members allowed to act? As, well, obviously they are. Mm -hmm. Well, but it's a struggle. Yeah. They don't like it. Uh, I mean, okay. I, I don't know that there's anything mm -hmm. official about it. But I had the CSB come to me and say, well, you have exhausted all the other alternatives. There is one more. And I was told by the case manager that works for a wall that that's not true. They are supposed to make that option available to you all the time. And so it's a form of gatekeeping, in my opinion. And just like you have to call the, the UNUR of your health insurance. But as far as I know, it should be open to anybody who qualifies on that okay. CIS score. What was your name? My name is Janet Reese. Janet, okay. So, Janet, I think your first question was talking about if the individual wants to work or has a job and doesn't primarily spend time at home. Um, absolutely. Um, we love that model. We would support that again. That's why it's so great because you have that one-on-one -on -one that um, it, the supports are based around that person, their needs, and, of course, their interests. So, yeah, if they want to work, um, that would obviously uh, be something that the sponsor would know ahead of time. Hey, this is how this might look if you decide to support this individual. Let's say if they didn't know each other, if they were being matched. Um, that you may only have, um, you may be with them in the mornings, taking them to work, and then in the afternoons. So, and typically those will be placed fine because, again, the, it doesn't necessarily change that pay because it is based, of course, on that tier. Yeah. Um, the second thing you had said was about the relief and what would happen with the sponsor's life if the things had changed. And I'm sure Rachel can um, add a little bit to this, but we, we always like to have our sponsors um, kind of recruit someone too sometimes. Um, we try to make the process as painless as possible so that their relief staff can kind of attend those trainings with them. And um, we've had people that have a, a neighbor. Um, maybe a family member of the individual that, that's interested, or maybe they have a, um, a son or daughter that lives in the home that's older that's interested in, in being a relief staff for them. Um, and our relief staff is actually the sponsor pays the relief staff. Um, so the sponsor gets that, that reimbursement check that comes in from the state, and then the sponsor depicts the payment for the relief. And if they want to do that based hourly, that works as well. Um, and then the last thing with the family members uh, that you had mentioned about can family members be the, the sponsors? And yes, what he, he had made a comment about, you are kind of put through the ringer a little bit. Um, family members are. There are some additional regs that the state has as far as ensuring that, like you said, every other effort has been exhausted. Um, but we can still make it possible if you have a good support team and a good group with you to kind of help to show the state that, hey, this is, this is successful and this is how we can justify it, it's absolutely doable. Did you want to add anything with the release? Um, no, the, Sorry, thank you. <laughs> the beauty of the model that Mike has for his son mm -hmm. is his son stays in that house forever. Mm -hmm. So let's say I find someone that I want to get married to and I move out, mm -hmm. somebody else is going to move in. So the continuity of care is there. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to touch on the first um, item where you asked about work. Mm -hmm. um, Let's say you have an individual that can't work 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. What if they really want to be involved in community activities and they as a volunteer basis? Um, I'm very active in the PTA because I have a chunk of my time between 9 and 3 where I'm, like, I'm twiddling my thumbs. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I, I need to be out there. I volunteer heavily with my son's PTA. Mm -hmm. And there have been several occasions where I take the individual with me, where we're setting up for Teacher Appreciation Week, mm -hmm. or we're there for an ice cream social, and he's there. He's setting up cups. He's setting up napkins. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about the sponsored residential mm -hmm. model, is that it's more organic. Mm -hmm. He's out in the community every day. We go to the grocery store. He's pushing the cart, or he's mm -hmm. putting items in the cart. Mm -hmm. We run out of cat food. He's there with me. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's more organic than it is like a set mm -hmm. schedule per se, mm -hmm. but as Catherine was saying, we're there to support the individual. And if that's what they want to do, we're right there. So, but you're not his parent, as you said, right. you're his, his peer. Uh -huh. So yeah. how do you deal with it if, if there are certain behavioral challenges that come up? Mm -hmm. Well, it's been in in my humble opinion, that re the reason we have behaviors is because a need is not being met. Mm -hmm. And if you step aside from your own feelings mm -hmm. and you think, okay, let's see, he's stomping his foot or he's tossing this down, why is that? Mm -hmm. You know, as the environment changed, mm -hmm. and it's my job to put my ego to the side, and we learn this in training. Um, so you learn that as a parent too. <laughs> and, and, oh, oh no, go ahead. Um, and you figure why, why, what is this behavior? Why is it occurring? And what can I do to not necessarily fix the problem, but walk the individual through it? And I have found that works best with my individual, letting him be part of the solution. And I say, oh, you seem very upset. What are you upset about? And it might take a, f a couple, two, three times of me asking, what are you upset about, before he can express that to me. And then I'll give him choices on how to resolve it. You, you want to throw right now. Can we throw this pillow or can we throw this water bottle? And he will usually you know, give me the choice of what he wants to do, and that seems to be what works best for us. It, it's important to look at behavior like a form of communication, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. It's just it's the voice of the unheard. Yes. Well, I think that you know it's really important to understand that this model is extremely flexible and has and very wide ranging. It just you know you can create anything that you want out of the avail availability of, of people willing to do the work. Um, you know we have every kind of uh, situation that can occur, and every and every it, the critical thing and the thing that I think that our agency has tried to work really hard on is getting the right match and only placing a person in a, in, within a family that has the capacity to meet those needs, to have the expertise or to receive the training so they can do whatever is necessary for that individual. And there are degree of supports that can be provided around that system. I mean, you do have what we refer to as backup workers or other workers that come in the home. And in fact, we do require that all of our providers have somebody that is available to come in the home so that the, you know, the, the um, sponsored family can get a break. But we do have, you know, all kinds of different providers out there, and we're dealing with uh, all different levels of disability, all different levels of activities in the community. We've got anything from uh, totally bedridden to very independent uh, individuals who spend a lot of time uh, with uh, independent activities. We also have a variety of dis different disability types. Um, our agency, we do serve uh, a good number of folks that are uh, not funded under the waiver, but are funded under uh, discharge assistance plan funding, which is a mental health, long-term mental health funding. Not a lot of it available in Virginia, but for people that are coming out of institutions, we do place a lot of folks uh, coming out of uh, Western State Hospital, Central State, uh, Catawba Hospital, with very long-term mental illness problems and fairly complex disabilities. And we're also serving folks that are, you know, not guilty by reason of insanity or other kinds of complex things that require some uh, special oversight. This model is really, I mean, the reason we got like a really good relationship with some of these mental health facilities is because these folks are complicated to place and they don't fit into a group home. And you know, there are also these other, you know, when you're talking about a mental illness, you're talking about something of a person who may have very variable levels of, of support need. And you try to place that person into a group home with a regimented schedule and staff coming in on different, on different 
um, uh, shifts and things, that doesn't really work for that. But this area where you've got a committed family with excellent background and, and uh, skills in working with a mental illness, so the you know, person gets up one morning, they got a bad day. Uh, Rachel was mentioning this a little bit too. You know, you've got variabilities in the ability of the individual to cope with different parts of their life. And you, this model allows that, that service to be tailored to meet the needs of the individual and respond to that just like a natural family might with uh, a normal child in that environment. But that is uh, an extremely important uh, aspect. And also, as has been mentioned, you know, the ability to include people in any kind of, you know, incidental learning and involvement with going to the grocery store or, you know, participating in, in church activities or doing things with the family, that is a powerful uh, experience level that is, you know, somewhat difficult to achieve. And, of course, the big thing is this is the model that the only model outside of independent living, which is an individualized service. It can be an individualized service. So, you, you know, most of our services are people, one person living in a, in a home environment. You know, there's no, there's no financial ability to do that kind of thing in a shift-based group home model. There's no way financially anybody can run a, a one-bed group home um, or even two- or three-bed. It's, you know, virtually financially impossible. But then you, you fund this fundless money. You put this package deal of funding going to the – family provider, and they, um, you know, they're providing all that. They provide their, they use their uh, personal vehicle for transportation. They, they have their home already. Um, they are experienced in, in preparing meals. They've got, um, you know, they've got, you know, a support system. They have activities they're involved with. All those things are already there as part of a package deal, and it is the ideal. I mean, I remember back uh, – in the uh, 70s when I was working in institutional settings, and we used to sit around at, at break time with the staff, uh, with the staff and, and talk about how much money the state was paying for those people to be served in the institution and thinking, man, you know, if we could just have half that or, or a fifth of that and take these folks home and provide, a, you know, a quality service for them in our own home, well, that's what this model is. It allows the staff that, are, that have been working in some other setting to take these folks home and, and do this kind of thing. Or, you know, as, as Dave is mentioning, this, this thing where families can do the service themselves and be able to continue that with the conditions being met that it's there. I also want to mention, uh, talk a little bit about what David had mentioned about the, the CIS score and stuff. This is a complicated problem right now. Uh, we have serious problems in Virginia with the implementation of the um, sports intensity scale and the tier-based uh, Model. There are a lot of folks in Virginia who have been inaccurately, usually it's on the, the low side of, of, um, of, of, of um, assessment for um, level of disability, and uh, it, it is a problem. The, uh, you know, the Virginia Network of Private Providers is doing a study. They, they insisted, and we participated with them because we're a member of the VNPP, and we um, you know, advocated quite a bit this year to get the General Assembly to pay attention to the issues with the uh, sports intensity scale because it does have a lot of problem with inter inter liability. And a lot of it has to do with the level of training on the part. You know, when you're doing the CIS score, basically, you know, it was mentioned that um, you're looking at the person's worst day. Well, really, the way I like to talk about it is that you're talking about how does that person function when they're just, you know, if you just put that person, sat them out on the street and they had no supports, you know, how is that person going to function when there's nobody around to give them cues, nobody around to um, help them with stuff? You know, how are they going to be able to work? How are they going to be able to manage? What can, what can they do and what can they not do? And that's where you need to get your uh, scores from. But it's like David was mentioning, you know, a lot of these folks that, are, that have been involved with uh, implementing the CIS score uh, have, a, I don't know what you call it, but they have an, an idea that, you know, because a person can can do a lot of things when they're in the supportive environment, that that that, that score needs to be lower, and that is a disservice to the uh, need for, to get adequate funding for the folks in the system. And we are trying to um, make sure that uh, Virginia does a better job with um, getting appropriate uh, scores being done. The other thing that was mentioned, you know, we've got the um, the ability to get on the waiver. It's sort of the same thing. When you're advocating for yourself to get a person funded by uh, a waiver slot, the, um, one of the problems that some 
parents have is that they don't advocate strong enough to be able to indicate the needs that their child would has, you know, the, the level of disability that's there. The, you know, it, it, we just have to make sure that um, people are getting the help that they need before the, the crisis occurs. And a lot of times with the, now they're using the VIDES as the assessment tool, but uh, a case manager has to go out and uh, meet with the family, and the family's got to be able to, to you know, ad adequately advocate for the risk factors that are there to um, to be able to be eligible for that for that waiver slot. So I will send out information about the SIS and waivers and advocacy to make both of them better to everybody, since that's something that's come up a lot. So um, for folks in the room for whom that seems a little bit um, foreign or difficult to work through, we'll definitely send things out. And also we had someone ask a great question, which is in a situation like Rachel's, which is kind of the reverse of the usual sponsored placement, who manages that property? Oh, you know, the, on that, you did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know because we write the checks. <laughs> no, it does. The uh, It's important to note, I think, Jen mentioned, and some others mentioned part of the SSI is required under the Blue Ridge, and I think most models, that they pay some of the rent. That's actually required under Social Security, to be honest. So he pays some of that rent, and then Rachel pays us rent. Make it clear that the house, uh, you have to, it depends how you're going to fund your mortgage. If you're going to go through VHDA, which is a nice source because you only have to put down a few percentage points of income for down payment, they make you make sure it pays for itself. Other mortgages don't do that. VHDA is a great program, but it also means you're stuck there because they won't refinance. But anyway, this I'll be done in just a second. And then, uh, but you want to go through that, and you get all the write-offs and everything else, just like it's a rental property. If you fund that Fannie Mae Exceptional Mortgage Program, you fund it that way. It's just like a rental property, but you you have much better uh, percentage rates. Sir, you had a comment? Hire a property manager, theoretically, if you wanted to not Good. give it yourself. Good. Cheap. Yes. <laughs> I think a gentleman back here had a comment. She, she had one, too. Yeah. 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 I'm wondering if you all can speak about the transition from my son to mm -hmm. stay with you, Rachel. Surely, you mentioned that it was more like adoption, such that oh. you are providing um, additional support for your son outside of your home. And so for that to happen, did the son, like, did it take a year or so? Well, did he hang out with, with Rachel's family first mm -hmm. for a couple of months and then gradually stay the day, maybe a weekend, and then extended that stay to the mm -hmm. point where within seven days he said, I yeah. want to go to my house. The plan was to do just what you described, which is I think most people recommend is a little bit here, a little bit there, and all that. Yep. Now, Rachel had taken care of Rogan on a couple of weekends and all that. Yes. Yeah. Seven days later, that plan went out the window. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they definitely yeah. do some trial visits um, yeah. just to kind of get a feel. Just for a few. The, adaptive, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. But I would think you'd want to look at that, but again, Rogan was well. And the other thing is, remember, Rachel had to move from her uh, two-bedroom apartment with two kids, a dog, blah blah blah, into a house. So we had to take care of all that kind of transition too, uh -huh. get her moved in, and then suit. So, but I, well, that was the plan. But I said it happened much more rapidly than we anticipated. And when Each we have, yeah, when we have vacancies, like if we have 16 homes and we have three or four, we want people to meet those sponsors and to build that relationship. Is, is this a home in the area that you want? Are these people that you're comfortable with? Is this the setting that you like? Are these you know, people that you get along with? Does it work for your work site or your day program or staying at home? Are there children in the home? Are there pets in the home? Mm -hmm. All of those things. So we always make sure to help facilitate and navigate that opportunity to visit and make a choice because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Even doing like weekend or overnight visits mm -hmm. before you make a final placement. Mm -hmm. the gentleman back there has his hand up about all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, so one question just to be clear is that Rogan's house is owned by an LLC? No, you own the house. it was. Oh. And when I first talked about this for the last nine years, <laughs> it was owned by an LLC through BHDA. VHD, Virginia Housing Development Agency, .com, but it's a state agency, they will allow you to purchase through either a microboard, which I do not recommend, or an LLC, which is a good way of getting you funded. However, almost no commercial lending bank or mortgage company will allow you to fund through an LLC and get the primary owner rate. That's why the Fannie Mae Exceptional Mortgage is such a good deal. You get the rate, normally a half percent or percent lower, like you're the primary buyer, but you get all the write-offs. Now, LLC is, I may be going with this, LLC is much better for legal protections and liability purposes 
and almost any real estate investor, not almost any, most real estate investors who are doing that for a living have their properties in an LLC. And we're going to do that again once the mortgage company doesn't figure, you know. So you have to be aware of that. Because one of the things there is a transfer of fund debt. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I have formed a market board so that's all we will hear about. I'm from Arlington. And Arlington is a little bit different than Fairfax and Falls Church. And that's quite exceptional. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, all we were here is, you got to do a micro board, micro board, micro board. Well, yeah. I finally did a micro board and I actually got a 501 uh, C3. So we're just starting to look at this issue and I kind of saw that this would work because I think it's important who owns the house because the biggest advantage of someone owning the house other than the group home is if your child does have a behavioral issue or a change, he gets to stay in the house. That's exactly that's right. That's what we decide for our kids. That's exactly right. Too. That they, we want them to stay in the house, and that if there's a problem, the care provider goes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we had looked at the micro board, but obviously, as we're starting, because we had someone who offered to sell us a house in Arlington, a New York kid. And by the time we started talking to Arlington and a few others, and you know, it was just going to take too long to get it done. So I'm really trying to make this model, I think, keep it general. You almost need to have the financing almost on a shelf. So when you do find the sponsor, you do find the house. It's easier to come. Yeah, I would get pre-qualified for the mortgage. Again, I'm not a financial planner. Right. But the other thing that I don't like about micro boards, I don't like uh, decisions by committee. Okay, that's just Mike Gillies. And my wife and I decide. Uh, by the way, I, I should mention something just as a side note. Our contract is very lengthy with Rachel. It says what she can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. and there are certain things. She does this, this, and she's gone. And, of course, she can resign any day she wants to. But I just want to spell it out. It's not like she, you know. And I'm not worried about it, but I just mentioned that if you are worried about it. But I think the LLC thing, the other thing about an LLC is you can have up to 10 members, I think in, in Virginia, I'm not sure what it is, and that means multiple people can buy in and help buy that property. But what I would recommend is get your mortgage first and then form the LLC because you're going to play hell getting it through an LLC. I just want to, the microphone we did is not to talk for it. Well, then we can all talk a lot about it. But who has the guardianship now? We do. I will say, there's a lot about microboards in the orange guide. We right. hand it out to right. folks in the room, and we'll send out to people on the phone. So there's tons of information so out there. I think about the, the guardianship and how how they can transfer and special needs trust. Um, just to mention all that stuff. Yep. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very good idea. And by the way, the guardianship, and I um, I don't get paid by ARC, <laughs> but they have you know full trust. They have a guardianship program, which is limited to the numbers that they can have. I think it opened up quite a bit, but it's limited. But there are organizations out there. If you don't have anybody local, like who's going to take care of it? The only thing about a guardianship that you have to be aware of, you're not making a decision what the kid's eating for supper. That's Rachel's problem, okay? <laughs> you're making a decision, should he have this surgery? Mm -hmm. Should he move here? Should we invest in this? Where does his trust money go? Guardians don't really make a heck of a lot of decisions every year as guardians. It's just they don't. It's a simple fact of life. Uh, and that's why you have attorneys who can do it. They can get you nice fees, but they're not making a decision every day. You know, so you keep that in mind because guardianship, I think a lot of people sweat that. And there's a lot of, for example, my, our two sons, upon our death, by the guardianship, neither one of them's ever going to move out of New York City. I'm convinced of that now. The other one's in the Navy. Lord knows when he's going to get out and what's going to happen. So, but it's not that big a deal. Just I want you to be aware of that because that's a big fear point. Well, Very good point. Well, the guardian is making decisions over issues involving substantial risk. That's where they have to step in. I mean, if you've got surgery or something or uh, certain kinds of psychotropic medication being prescribed, you've, you know, you've got there where there, where there is a, a risk of um, side effects and things, when the, that's when you really have to get um, a guardian or authorized representative to um, sign off on that. But Mike's correct, you know, the, the, av the daily living things. Of course, that's one of the important things about the um, way that a guardianship uh, court order is written up, that you're, you know, providing uh, freedom for the individual to make some decisions themselves and not be hampered by um, restrictions that could be in the, in the guardianship papers. I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, issues been asked about on transition planning. Um, you know, there is uh, an, important, an important need for um, people to get choice and to be able to, you know, work on getting uh, adequate services, uh, finding out and visiting with um, the prospective families and, and making sure that the match does exist there. But the, uh, I know there's a lot of questions about what happens when the sponsor 
quits or something, uh, you know, they're, the, um, as an agency, you know, we're, we're supporting over 500 people and, and have for a while, and we've, you know, we've, the advantage of, of a larger network, though, I mean, one of the advantages of, in general with a sponsored residential model is that it's, it's possible to have vacant beds that are sitting around, um, families that are, have extra capacity to meet the need, and um, those beds are critical. And that's why we're always trying to recruit more providers, even more than, than in, in areas where, well, right now we're at our lowest level of available providers that we've had because the, the, the model has been exploding with the number of uh, referrals we're getting. Of course, you know, that's the part of the transition with uh, people coming out of state facilities and, um, and the waiver uh, slots being allocated. But, the, um, but in general, you've got a lot of vacant beds that occur within some of these families, and that provides you with the ability that if something were to occur in one service, with the number of, of services we have, in our agency we're broken up into about 11 different regions, and we try to focus those families, those families get together several times a year, um, get to know each other, and, and they're also, of course, they are a primary tool for recruiting new providers. It's word of mouth that is your um, absolute best way to get new providers because it's a model that the general population doesn't really understand. You can't put an ad in the paper and expect to recruit people that are, are able to do this work because they don't um, really understand it. But we have to get um, – we have to develop an, enough capacity in the system so that if something occurs with one service that we have other choices that are out there to move. And we, now, but the other, other aspect of it, though, is that the longevity we are getting, because the funding is good in this model, you know, our average payment for family per individual in our system anyway is uh, something over $65,000 of tax-free money per year um, per individual. Uh, so, you know, it's not, it's not, and that's, that's an average, but, well, actually the average is probably a little bit higher than that because we've got some more people coming in with higher disability level of needs, and there are things like you can do, you know, if you've got people with severe medical needs, we've got uh, nurses that are on, on contract with nurse billing that's, that's possible with the, the, the new waiver, and of course now we've got the new um, day support billing, community engagement, community coaching stuff that adds to that. So there are lots of, of resources available with this model, and that level of funding means that we do retain our, our providers, our very long-standing people. I'm just, I just signed a bunch of paper last week for uh, some of our providers who have been with us over 20 years, and um, we don't get a lot of turnover. I mean, but, but you do get situations where situations change. You know, we had, uh, I was working with a, an individual uh, last week who, um, had severe medical problems that, that uh, caused a person to be, uh, at least for a period of time, non-ambulatory, and the home that that person was living in was not really suitable. But we have another service across town where the um, person is set up with a wheelchair-accessible home and, and are able to provide that support. And, of course, we're always working through the case managers to uh, arrange the, you know, ethical looking at, at how the uh, choices of supports are there, but there are a lot of, because of the networking that's going on within our system, there is a lot of potential to create the uh, supports that people need on a, you know, in a very short period of time. It, it, we can make a decision within a day if there is something else that has to be done um, because of the strength of the network of people that are out there, we, um, we, we can meet the need. You know, I mean, no, nobody's going homeless with this situation. We are able to be resourceful and come up with quality services that meets the need on a continuing basis. So if we can go back to thinking about how the sponsored service takes place in a licensed home, that means the reason we have all of these service providers up here is because they do all of that licensing and all that legwork that's not left to the sponsor to do or the individual's family to do. And one of the huge benefits of that is not only the upfront benefit of screening and training and oversight, but to Jack's point and what people have asked about here, that means if a sponsor or the individual who's working with that sponsor no longer feel like they have a match, it's not the parents 
who all of a sudden are finding a whole new situation and, and rerouting everything. It's obviously it evolves, yeah. whose job it is to do those kinds of things and see a much broader picture. I have a question. Well, mm -hmm. Lady back there. Yeah. He's raised yours about 25 times. <laughs> so um, I have a 19-year-old um, son. Um, and I'm just learning about this. I also have two younger kids in the house. Um, this is a model that actually my husband and I talked about. We would basically split up. And I would live with the, um, my 19-year-old, or you know, vice versa. So I'm very interested in this, mm -hmm. um, just for the safety of my other kids in the house. Um, we are on the IDDD uh, wait list. Um, we're on a level five or something, because he was hospitalized last year. So, I, so my whole thing is, and this may be slightly off topic, and I apologize. Um, at some point, and I know this is up to the state, at some point this kicks in and I, and I get this ID waiver, which is now called the Community Living Waiver, and I can fund this program. But until that happens, I'm in this situation that I'm... Where, where do you live? Where do you live? Like right on the park. Right. <laughs> Fairfax <laughs> County. Fairfax County. Yeah. Fairfax County That's CSB. Right. We have a yeah. case yeah. manager. So I got a guy there. I talked to him a lot. You know, and he we did a little quick phone interview. He's like, you know, has, does this happen to you? Uh, you know, are you uh, 55 and older? No. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all those questions yeah. asked. He's got my level. I'm like at a level now. My score is like a 22 or something. So mm -hmm. I think that's better. So I was just wondering. Because I, I, this sounds amazing to me, and we would do this. I mean, even at the short term, you know, we're talking about, you know, we would get an apartment and basically separate the kids. Um, you know, not an ideal situation well, of a strong marriage, but um, I guess that's what I'm looking for. Can I make a just a, yep. this is off the wall, and I realize that's part of the thing here. Are you aware of these units where they put them right in your backyard and they're like a lot, little mini apartment? No. Okay, first, we can talk about that afterwards. That's what I would do instead of renting an apartment in your situation. If you've got a backyard, yeah. you can plop this puppy down. It's basically a big bedroom with a tiny kitchen and a tiny thing. It's normally meant for in-laws or mother and Some people call them granny pods. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, granny. I knew there was a name I didn't recognize. Yeah, if you Google granny pods. Pod. <laughs> you could live there. You could, you, your son could live basically in that with you, and that way you've got all the advantages of the house. You're there with your family, and you don't have to do the situation you're talking about. Okay, now I'll shut up. <laughs> so it is complicated, and those are the kinds of questions I walk people through a lot, so I want them to answer from the sponsored perspective, but again, just kind of like putting in a plug, always feel free to call me or email me directly, and like I'm, I'll walk you through whatever there is the lay of the land, but it is definitely true that without a waiver actually in hand, so many doors are closed because the waiver is really what's funding those support services, but we can talk about ways to get you closer to that waiver. Well, yeah, and I'm betting that any one of us here would mm -hmm. be happy to show you, tour you, mm -hmm. talk to you. I did yeah. one last week with a gentleman. His, um, his son is currently in Massachusetts at the expense of Fairfax County Schools, and so but he knows he'll get the waiver next year because of the whole institutional thing and whatever. So he just came in and wanted a tour to look at some of our homes. When I get back from vacation, he's going to see a sponsor home, and he just wants to know what the, what the choices are. I just wanted to say one thing back to the comment that uh, this nice lady was making about, uh, you know, how do you get the, like, know mm. the behaviors and stuff mm. and deal with all the behaviors. You're not just thrown into the water off of a ship mm -hmm. to see if you can Good point. swim. <laughs> all of these folks, I'm sure, I know Jack's company does, they have ongoing continuing education mm -hmm. for human mm -hmm. rights and yeah. for behavior supports the, right. so that you can go mm -hmm. in and know how to deal with knowledge on some of these mm -hmm. very technical things. Like with my son, it is very technical. If he was not living at home with us, he would probably be in jail or you know, in, in an institution. And even with the supports, um, last fall we had to call the cops at his day program. And he goes to a day program, but we had to call the cops and, and they had to put him on a backboard. They were going to put him in handcuffs and throw him in a cop car. I said, no, that's not. You have all the power as the parent or the guardian, so you need to exercise that power and make sure he's safe or they're safe. And so. I say we're not going to do that, guys. What we're going to do is we're just going to keep things secure here until the rescue squad gets here. Put him on a mummy restraint backboard, and we're going to be gentle. And, and uh, you know, we had to hog tie him till they got here because he was that bad. He was trying to bite the cops. It was a bad situation. And that, that's happened, um, you know, a few times over the last few years. 
But there's a lot of things you can do before it ever gets to that level to just de-escalate, and they teach mm -hmm. us all that stuff. So that was the exception, but that's why we need these supports. That was the worst day ever, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I want to add to just a side, I'm, I know you <coughs> yeah, real quickly. The other side of that coin is, what if my adult child's not being taken care of properly? Mm -hmm. Whether if you deliberately, which is very rare, because the screen these people go through is, you know, I thought it was hard to get a TS clearance. It's nothing compared to this. Right. <laughs> okay? But, for example, I know of a situation where a woman who'd been providing care for 25 years, she's actually worked with Rogue and got us into it because of physical conditioning and things of that nature. She had a very difficult problem, and the child that she was working with, the adult child, could get very physical, so it's just something had to change. And the agency in charge of that recognized that and made it happen. Was it painful? You're damn right it was. It was hard for everybody. Nobody really wanted to do it. But you got to do what you got to do, and that's what these people, these three right here, that's what their agencies and Jack get paid for. Not only to help you get through that, but I can't stress enough the relief I get knowing, cause having seen it work, that someone's going to be looking out for my son, both everything. You, I mean, fire extinguishers. I don't know how many she's required to have. Guess what? CO2 detectors yeah. uh, as well as hard, we're hardwired. And we've never had one in our house. Yeah. Okay, is he better care? Mm, yeah, but he's safer. You know, we should have <laughs> that. Year. That's the kind of thing where you got to get past that thought that nobody else can take as good a care or he won't be under some kind of oversight. you got to get past that as a parent. I, I, I realized after talking to groups for this for the last 10 years that it's overwhelming all that financial, but it's really, I think, more about the emotional side of it getting started. Okay. Oh, yeah. Question. Well, we, and you know, I just explained that the level of support and the and oversight is really high. I mean, I, I know with our agency, we're in, uh, we have a program manager in the home, at least every month, and availability continually as far as um, the special needs that come up. Um, the the reporting requirements, the training we're doing as far as far as reporting, I mean David can attest or anybody here can attest. You know the incident reporting. You know if anybody bumps their elbow, you you have to file an incident report. Anytime a person goes to the doctor with uh, an unscheduled uh, visit or emergency room or something, that's all an incident report. Uh, you know we our agency we've got um, a medical director and and multiple uh, nurses around the area. We've got. A uh, certain number of uh, licensed cons professional counselors or L L L LCSWs, but we're, and we're looking for you know some more to create e even stronger network for the behavioral support part of it. Um, you know we got uh, 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 certified uh, behavior analysts on staff, so you get a lot of different things. Plus the uh, you, know, you get the Reach program in the state for um, crisis intervention. Um, so there is a, a lot there, um, which doesn't take away from the challenge of doing this work because, you know, you can have as many support people or professionals around, but, you know, dealing with some of these instances occur are very challenging, but, you know, we, we have dedicated people that are working to try to make sure that those issues are addressed in the best way we possibly can. Yep. <clears throat> What are the parent opportunities to have that child go, say, for the weekends or oh. uh, for some oh, yeah. vacation or over holiday? Yep. They can go home anytime they want. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that would just be a matter of communicating with the provider. Mm -hmm. With the sponsor, yeah. Um, well, I'm just wondering if you're paid by the day, right. so, um, can they continue to be paid even though the parents have never mm -hmm. that? No, that they have no. to be. Well, they do, actually, because, well, right now the new waiver, um, the billing is actually 344 days a year, which gives you a 21 day period that yeah. where the person can be out of the service without any impact on the amount of billing that's occurring. Um, but you know, and now we're paying our providers 365 days a year because of that, you know, we want to make sure we're giving coverage for the whole thing that nobody's getting lapses in pay. But it is. Uh, a system that is really designed, and of course, even beyond the 21 days, it's easily possible to have folks going home a lot more than that if, if that's part of their plan. Um, you know, it's an arrangement that is developed between the natural family and the sponsor provider. Um, you know, the, 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 the miracle list model, again, is that it's highly flexible, and as somebody was mentioning, I may have been Mike or somebody, but you know, the dedication of the provider 
the relationship that's there, this is like, you know, a co-service. Some of the families can actually provide some excellent mm -hmm. relief time for providers and that kind of thing, and also, you know, just really develops that quality of life that we're all looking for and having multiple relationships and, and doing a lot of things. But, it, you know, everything has to be worked out. You know, the, you know, we write some incredibly detailed service plans, which is a, a, basically a kind of a contract, and all those different issues, you know, need to be discussed, and we try to really work hard at, at introducing all those issues. You know, how do all kinds of different situations get handled and what are the preferences that are there? And writing that into the plan, so, and also, of course, we write into the plan any of the interventions that may be anticipated to be needed. Those all have to be in writing so that we are uh, clear on what is an appropriate response to any kind of need that may come up. I, I point out, I, Rogue and I go to runway a couple times a week at least. My wife loves chick flicks. She does not like Wonder Woman, Guardians of the Galaxy, and all the good movies. <laughs> I talk to Rogan once in a while. We'll go to what I consider a man movie, thank God. Uh, but it's up to us. But we also, we just went to a uh, graduation party for her daughter. We've been to mm -hmm. Rachel's birthday party. We went to Savannah's birthday party. We meet each other in the community. Yeah, all the time. Um, we run into each other. And, uh, and I'm sure <laughs> all all of these with you as well, like when, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. So like your family can oh, yeah, yeah, that's something, that's too, that the sponsor too. already has in, in place. Like, hey, every weekend I go and do this, or every um, so often I visit family here. Well, the individual wants to come. What do you think? Yeah. That, yeah. That's why God invented the telephone and text. Yeah. yeah. And email. Well, that actually is one of the big questions. That is one of the big things, too, is that individuals going on, on, on vacations with the, the sponsor with family. Sponsor. Uh, it is yeah. typical, although we do try to also promote, you know, that the, that the family gets a break occasionally mm -hmm. from that uh, sure. right. service mm -hmm. responsibility and have some um, way time, which is also good for um, not getting an enmeshment in terms of the um, – relationship being the sole um, support mm -hmm. for that person. Yeah. My, my question was, one of you said before that this whole model came up. You realized there were a group of kids who weren't being served by the options available. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask a question on the providers that I haven't heard, because it seems clear that this works really well for people with heavily heavy behavior or medical situations, unusual more challenging things. But there's also the square peg round hole thing for kids who have been brought up through IDEA and other things mm -hmm. who are very, very independent, mm -hmm. capable, working to a point and where there's still a lot of hesitation in group homes, they're often too restrictive and yet you're living on their own. You're saying to yourself, no, things come up in, in the middle of the night when there's a power going out or something happening or getting sick or needing more help with money or planning or occasionally they can do a routine transportation and an unusual transportation. And, and I think my team and other people might be looking at this. I was wondering if you if there's any part of your model that aims towards matching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think Zach touched on that when he spoke about tiers, and, and it's just fancy terminology for, let's say someone at a level one might just need like a more of a monitoring, like what you are talking about, might need a little bit more help today, but not so much tomorrow. And someone on a tier two might need more hands-on, um, and that's why... We have but been you people who want yeah. to sponsor ones where mm -hmm. a lot of people, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's less work, yeah, yeah, back mm -hmm. from the family mm -hmm. where they still might like to have, you know, what they think of a place in a that's. We have that we definitely support people like that, um, and it does raise. Um, you know, spread across the spectrum of, of services and supports. And there are other new housing options as well, shared living, which is outside the realm of sponsored residential. But what we, because sponsored residential is considered a 24-hour service, if that person has um, skill sets that 
where they work or they ride the bus home or they take, you know, Metro Access home, we write into their plan that from this time to this time they're unsupervised. The sponsor mm -hmm. comes home. We do have some sponsors that work, and so mm -hmm. they come home. They have backup staff if somebody is sick or there's some type of situation where somebody needs to be home during the day. But absolutely, um, we have people who are very capable and independent. They have um, tasks that they're responsible for that they do before the person gets home. I took a call two weeks ago. You know, I've had some issues with the dishwasher being broken and some other things. I said, then write out the tasks that the person that, that you know is capable. And then when you get home, you're supporting them to make sure that the dishwasher is loaded appropriately, that the right soap is being used, those kind of things. So Swiffering, dusting, those other types of things. Yeah, the person can do. They want to be home alone. It's in their plan mm -hmm. that they are home alone for a certain amount of time. Or that they have a cell phone so that when they have a social event, that they can schedule Uber themselves or schedule a ride or whatever, that they check in with that sponsor to know that they are where they arrived and that, they're and that they're where they're supposed to be and that they are with friends and that they check in and they're home by a certain time or that they are calling by a certain time to make sure that they are where they're supposed to be. So my what wife is the call, range? Is that my wife? It's the whole spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 24-7 medical. Yeah. Actually, a lot of providers that, that um, re request to be, become providers, that, that's the ideal client that they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They want the person that's more independent, yeah. that can mm -hmm. be loud and right. Easy right. folks. Um, yeah, they're the easy Part ones. of that match process <laughs> is also making sure you as the sponsor, um, when you have these trial visits, is this going to be the, the individual that, that you do want to support. Your trainings are going to be um, Still, just the, the same amount of yes. detail and the documentation and such, but again, that will depend on that plan, how much you're, you're having to actually support and then document on that. But um, yeah, that's absolutely possible. Um, you've talked quite a bit about, uh, uh, you know, that there are these wonderful people who are acting um, in this situation, but realistically speaking, how big a pool of candidates do you have to act as the sponsor? Well, I, I, I heard, heard Jen, who um, brought up how do you find, I think maybe it was a write-in yeah, question. About how do you find, you, yeah. Mm. And I just wanted to say, coach from their day program. <laughs> <laughs> I have, um, I'm on the second person um, who works at my individual's day program where I'm taught, I, I connected the, her with mm -hmm. Catherine. I'm like, just try, you're gonna love it. Mm -hmm. Because these are individuals that have, a desire to work with people with special needs, but they get paid peanuts and they get burned out so quickly. So grab them. Grab them while you can. Talk to them about the model. Um, and look at the people who are in your life who like your individual. Mm -hmm. I think that pool has grown over mm -hmm. the years because yep. now the word is out that mm -hmm. you can become a provider, that this is a service that's offered out there. So I think that, you know, that, that pool is, is, is great. <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. we all have a, a substantial today's pool, provider. Mm -hmm. so. Today's pool doesn't mean much unless you're ready to do it. Yeah, that's true. You need to think six, nine months about and you should take that longer. Yeah, it is, it is reaching out to those people. But, you know, it is, like was mentioned, though, I think the nice thing about this model is you can look at those people who are excellent at caregiving. I mean, we're not, we're talking, the skills we're looking for here are caregiving skills, the commitment, the passion to do this kind of work well. So you can go out and, you know, you can re recruit those special education aides. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily have to be the person that's the, um, the, that's the teacher itself, mm -hmm. although we, we have a lot of those as well. But folks that are um, passionate about this kind of work, because they have to be very responsible people, because you are managing an entire service, and you've got to be able to comply with all the regulations and all of the reporting requirements. But still, this is an opportunity for a lot of people that have um, a lot of life experience, um, potentially, but have um, may not have gotten the college degree, but they they have you know have have done some things in their life, so they've got a home, or they got the capability to do some of these things, and can be brought in, and maybe they've got a connection to the individual that, you know, that needs the service, trying to find those link-ups where, um, I mean, we have recruited folks that, um, that may get a waiver and they have um, somebody that worked with them in, when they were in special education in school that we recruit to, to, do, to become a provider, and that's a great opportunity. As mentioned, it's a better. Question in the way back. 
That's an yeah, so how long question. does it take to be ready once you identify a potential sponsor to get them up and going? <laughs> it depends on how quickly they can get all of everything together. So there are licensing standards as it relates to their home. They have to provide three months' worth of financial stability independent of getting paid for providing the service. You have to schedule with your licensing specialists, like they said, fire extinguishers, CO2, those kind of things. Quickly, I would say four to six weeks. But it really, um, because they also have to come through our orientation training, we actually have a contract that's required, and we also require them to carry liability insurance. So that takes a little bit longer as well. But I would say if you had someone who walked in with most things ready, you could do it that quickly, but that would be the perfect situation. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's probably going to take closer to two to three months. Mm -hmm. Could I just throw out something, too? A lot of people, I don't think Rachel could have coughed up. <laughs> Right. You know, three months of financial support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing wrong with you writing that, saying I, will, I put it in formal writing, notarized, blah, blah, blah. I am responsible for those debts, and I will accept those. Mm -hmm. We did that. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, if you don't have the waiver and you're interested, do you really have to wait till you have the waiver in hand to explore the possibility? Or yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm sure all yeah, of us would be happy to. Yeah, and I think Mike was saying to get the mortgage in place. And I think the, the more. Well, that's, that's, like, I think that's talking about your own. You're just talking about the Okay, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Developing. Yeah, any of these yeah. folks. Just to start yeah. training process of developing as a sponsor? Well, if you're or? interested and you sort of see what it takes to get to where you want to go, but you don't have the waiver. Yeah. 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 If your child. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, yeah, it, it is worthwhile to be exploring all the alternatives and trying to find a potential um, service or be looking around. You know, there's a lot of education because it isn't something that, that happens right away. So I do think it is worthwhile looking, although, you know, you have to really advocate with that case manager to um, push at the right time. I know right now I guess they're looking at slots being available in July and you know you you have to push to be at the top of the list to get those slots coming out but when you get the you know the the problem is when if a slot gets allocated let's say tomorrow you got a, a slot allocated well you got a 30 or 60 days to actually get some of those services implemented it's you know you got a, a quick turnaround and you really can't put it off so you have to kind of be prepared when the slot is allocated well, then how do we get prepared? Do we go and visit? Yep, yeah, visit services that are out there. Yeah. See that guide that Lucy mentioned? It's got damn near everything you can think of in there. I mean, there's always going to be issues, but that orange guide? Yes, indeed. I, I'm just wondering, we take it upon ourselves to go knock on your doors in person and say, look, <laughs> I'm hoping that we get July or even next July or whatever, so will you keep us in mind? And Yeah, websites are up here for everybody. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'll send our own contact information, too, to just say, can I see what's out there? Keep me in mind. Yeah. And we all have transition cards points. with us today. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The transition yeah. points that they talked about. control over mm -hmm. when we're going to get a waiver. Mm -hmm. you know, none of us knows that. Oh, in the back. Hi, uh, <laughs> Teresa Champion. I, I'm a parent who's tried to do the sponsored residential, and I've been turned down by two of the groups on the panel um, because we have a very aggressive uh, young man. Um, I will say to other parents, if you want to begin the process, it, it was overwhelming to me to realize how much training had to happen. Yep. So there's medical uh, class, med, med management mm -hmm. classes you have to take, and I know Wall Residential was requiring their classes and those are four full days, is that Four right? days of medication administration training, yep, so and that's, that's required for the... Then there's um, life support, mm -hmm. uh, uh, first aid, that's a full day. And then you have and a three-day renewal, yeah. Management classes. So you're looking at about six to seven full days of training. So yep. if you really wanted to get a, a head start on it, you know, identify somebody you're going to be working with and then find out what they're... Mm -hmm. because their med management classes were only skipped. This is why I don't think you could do it in 90, you know, four weeks. Their med management class is only scheduled, you know, yeah. once or twice, and they're all over the state. So you really have to plan that. Um, but as parents, I mean, we have to plan. If you're going to be the, if, no, yeah. but if you're 
you're not going to identify who's going to be providing these services, then you want to get them started in, in taking these classes, potentially. I, you know, it's up to you. If you really feel like it's, you want to get it going right away, as soon as that waiver comes across, and everybody's committed, then I would identify a provider and, and get them going. Um, but we don't necessarily have to identify no. a provider. No, and it would be no. unusual. No, okay. Yeah. okay, but yeah, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. But there are situations where it would work well for some yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and you know now do do that that interview process mm -hmm. now. See who you want to work with and who mm -hmm. is best gonna. Um, but. I came today to try to get some more options, to get some more ideas. If, if I can't do this sponsored residential, or I also wanted to say, you know, try to build some flexibility into the plan because I, I was reading where it, it supposedly is for more complicated behaviors, but I'm not finding that. And so, you know, because people can't put hands on, you know, and so that's a problem if you have somebody who's aggressive. So I guess I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how can we accommodate within some of, you know, this is a great booklet that everybody's put together. How can we accommodate some of these more aggressive individuals? Well, you know, we have a son that's very aggressive, uh, can be violent. And um, as a rule, Wall Residences has a no hands-on policy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I learned was it's not wall. It's the way that everybody is going and oh, there's, sure, sure. there's a reason for that. You don't need to restrain somebody. When he was in an institution, he had the longest restraints of anybody there on record. 45 minutes, an hour and 10 minutes, and laying down restraints. Yep. You don't need that. Uh, they have uh, a person who is actually uh, a sponsored provider, but he also works for wall residences and it, and uh, does the uh, classes for uh, Tova, and uh, he used to be in the prison system in Alexandria, um, and he came to our house, and he did a custom program just for us and just for Chase, and he showed us exactly what we need to do and how to do it, and I had already taken other restraint training classes and so forth, so that was very helpful it was more of a custom-built approach rather than just general classes. But the primary thing is about human rights. I think mm -hmm. um, you made the, the comment, Rachel, that mm -hmm. you know when somebody's acting out, even when they're being violent, a lot of it is about they're not getting their needs met, mm -hmm. and it's really uh, a big part of that Toba class and Man classes and so forth are about determining what needs are not being met. And it takes a real intuition, and we're still learning, believe me. Oh, I understand, and, yeah. and right, but, but well, and... But you uh, sometimes got to deal with reality, you know? Right, so that's why I'm trying to figure out how can we really, within a system, accommodate somebody who... I'm just looking for ideas. Yeah. Well, it is a matter of getting the, I mean, the human rights system, I mean, there is a potential to get restrictive plans and in fact you know a lot of our individuals will have that in which you if you've got some kind of emergencies coming up then you write up and you get a you know you get a, a licensed clinician or somebody and you have it reviewed now that the system's changing a little bit but it had been being reviewed by the local human rights uh, committee but I think they're moving to the uh, regional advocate um, approved some independent of those plans yeah. yes uh, yeah you've got an independent review committee and that kind of thing, but so you, but you have to get those kinds of uh, restrictive plans approved. You know, even if you're going to restrict people having access to food, that requires uh, a restrictive plan for those kinds of things. There are, you know, lots of things, but they can be written in, and, um, you know, there, if, if there's approval on the part of uh, the independent review committees and such, then we can get some permission to do that. And also, I will say that in an emergency situation, you know, you can get people certified in a short period of time if they're motivated and they're willing to go through the training quickly and we've got you know, we, and we know we've got an emergency there then we can provide the trainers and get people through that in a short period of time but it all has to be uh, you know work together as a team to get what is needed but we've you know gotten 
plenty of ser plenty of services up and running in two week time if if the if the need is there and the people are willing to commit the uh, time well, along with our trainers to get some of that stuff done. Is, it, is there a final question from anybody before we? All right. Well, so I was going to put up here some resources, and again, we'll send these around to everybody. But first, there's a link to our orange guide that's here in the room. I think sometimes it's nice just to have an electronic version, even if you have the paper one, to do keyword searches and those kinds of things, and to send it to other people who may want to review it. Uh, and of course, for folks on the phone. And then, as I mentioned, we have the upcoming tours. So here's the link to sign up for them. There are links for the particular tours on that flyer. But if you go to this workshop page, you can see our housing next panel that's coming up. You can see housing tours. You can see all the other kinds of things that we're doing too. So it's a good place to kind of go through and farm out now based upon the ideas you had today, what you want to see and do next. And then here is the Department of Behavioral Health and developmental services page on waiver redesigns as we talked a lot today about waivers in this new system and CISs and tiers and rates and how all these things play together. Um, this is the page where they have used to talk about that and I'll send some more information that's kind of filtered through our <coughs> try and be more family friendly terms but kind of straight from the horse's mouth. I think it's valuable to look at those kinds of things and you get a good sense about what the state is thinking and planning as you start to tool through more and more things. I just wanted to give our panelists a huge, huge round of applause and thank them very, very much. Put my email on it. Put my email on it. So, with that being done, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. <laughs>